Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to The Global Current. I'm Morgan Mount. And I'm Jack LaForge. Today in news, increased naval activity in the South China Sea. French presidential race heats up as election grows closer. In analysis, the implications of a recent meeting between leaders of Germany's far-right-wing party with Russian officials. And famine is declared in South Sudan. Then, an interview with Seton Hall's associate professor, Nabila Alam. And now, Jacob Abel brings us a report on increased naval activity in the South China Sea. And now, Jacob Abel brings us a report on increased naval activity in the South China Sea. On February 10, 2017, U.S. President Donald Trump held a joint press conference with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, in which he reaffirmed the United States' security commitment to Japan. At the press conference, Trump did not bring up any of the rhetoric that he used while he was campaigning, such as the perception of lopsided U.S. financial commitment to Japan's defense. Trump stated at the press conference, it is important that both Japan and the United States continue to invest very heavily in the alliance to build up our defense and our defensive capabilities, which under our mutual leadership will become stronger and stronger. According to USA Today, the two leaders also discussed the growing threat from North Korea's nuclear program, as well as China's continued activity in the South China Sea. The bond between our two nations and the friendship between our two peoples runs very, very deep. This administration is committed to bringing those ties even closer. We are committed to the security of Japan and all areas under its administrative control and to further strengthening our very crucial alliance. After their meeting in Washington, the two leaders flew on Air Force One to Trump's golf resort at Mar Largo, Florida. According to Reuters, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe promised to create jobs in the U.S. in an effort to garner more support for the U.S.-Japan alliance. The two days Trump spent with Abe is the longest he has spent with any foreign leader. On February 20th, the U.S. aircraft carrier Carl Vinson, along with the guided missile destroyer USS Wayne E. Mare, began what the U.S. Navy calls routine operations. According to CNN, the Chinese were made aware of the patrols before they started and warned the United States against trying to challenge the sovereignty of China. The new patrols come after the newly appointed Secretary of State Rex Tillerson stated in his confirmation hearing that the U.S. would seek to take a tougher stance in the South China Sea. According to the Japan Times, ships from the Vincent Strike Group took part in drills in Hawaii and Guam in order to better prepare for the drills in the South China Sea. The new U.S. administration seems to want to take a tougher stance on China and form a closer relationship with Japan, so it will be interesting to see what the future policy of the United States will be. This is Jacob Abel reporting for The Global Current. Up next, Liam Scollins reports on developments in the French presidential election. An independent candidate, Emmanuel Macron, has made substantial gains in opinion polls leading up to the French presidential election. However, Macron is still polling second to far-right candidate Marine Le Pen and narrowly edging out center-right candidate François Fillon, according to The Economist. France uses a runoff system in which the leading two candidates of the first round, scheduled for April 23rd, advance to the second round on May 7th. This year's election has upset the political establishment and seen the rise of unknown political novices in the fall of established political figures. Macron, a 39-year-old former investment banker, falls ideologically in the center-left and has never held elected office. While the campaigns of his two main rivals, Le Pen and Fillon, have been rocked by allegations of corruption and misappropriation of public funds, Macron's campaign has emerged unscathed, according to The Guardian. Although Macron currently polls behind Le Pen, polls show that he would likely beat either leading candidate in the second round runoff. During a campaign speech, Macron commented on those who doubted his chances of being a viable candidate. To those who said that it was crazy and insane for me to win, you're behind me now. And politics will continue under these new rules.
Adding to Macron's momentum, a leading centrist politician, François Bayrou, recently endorsed him, according to The Independent. With Bayrou's endorsement, Macron has risen in the polls. However, Macron's advancement to the second round of the election is still contingent upon him placing higher than Fillon, who currently trails by less than 1%, according to a poll from The Economist. The improbable rise of Macron's En Marche movement stands as a stark counterbalance to the wave of right-wing populism, specifically that of Marine Le Pen's Le Front National. As the election draws closer, Macron continues to make regular speeches around France and abroad, while his two rivals attempt to diminish the severity of corruption allegations against them. While Macron's chances of winning are high, this election season has seen even more shocking upsets. This is Liam Scollins reporting for The Global Current. Next up, Michael Ianolfo analyzes the impact of a meeting between Russian officials and the leaders of Germany's far-right party. The leader of the right-wing Alternative for Germany party, or AFD, Frank Petre, recently met with Russian leaders, including the Speaker of the Duma, or Lower House, as well as his deputy. Also in attendance was the leader of a far-right Russian Nationalist Party, whose party is an ally of Vladimir Putin's party. Petre was invited to Moscow to discuss inter-party cooperation and developing contacts between youth organizations, according to a statement by the Duma. The rise in right-wing populism, both in Germany and in Europe as a whole, could drastically change the relationship between Russia and the West, as well as potentially affecting the relationship among Western countries themselves. These talks followed the March 2016 emergence of the AFD in state elections. In these elections, both of Germany's mainstream parties, the right-wing Christian Democratic Party, or CDU, and the left-wing Social Democratic Party, or SDP, lost seats. Thorsten Benner, an analyst for Bloomberg, explained, both parties had a really bad night because it was a clearly an anti-establishment uh, election uh, with up to 25% uh, going to a right-wing populist party. So none of the major parties in the Grand Coalition can be happy about this result. Can, can, AFD leaders claim that their success will force the main political parties to have an open debate about important issues in the country, particularly the refugee crisis. However, the establishment parties are concerned about the AFD, mainly because of the rhetoric of its leader. Frock Petre has espoused views that the CDU and SDU disagree with, including the view that police should, quote, prevent illegal border crossings using firearms if necessary. In September of 2016, the AFD continued its electoral success in Berlin. AFD coordinator Goreg Pazadersky explained the 12% of the vote was important because, quote, from zero to double digits, that's unique for Berlin. The Grand Coalition has been voted out, not yet in the federal level, but that will happen next year. The federal election set to take place in Germany later in 2017, the success of the AFD, in combination with Russian influence on right-wing parties in other European countries, such as France, has some in Germany concerned. Russia has given 11 million euros to the campaign of French right-wing leader Marine Le Pen. Le Pen has said she would remove France from NATO if she were to win in the French presidential election, which takes place in 2017. Given the most recent election of Donald Trump as president of the United States and his willingness to form a deal with Russia and improve relations, it is clear that Russia's influence in the West is on the rise. A more serious example of this is the recent attempted coup by Russian spies in the country of Montenegro. Russian spies attempted to assassinate the Prime Minister the same day that a vote to determine if the country should join NATO was held. The coup failed and the plotters were arrested and eventually sent back to Russia. However, the fact that a coup was attempted shows that Russia is not afraid to make aggressive attempts to expand its influence in other parts of Europe. Given the potential warming of relations between Russia and the United States, the possibility of Marine Le Pen winning the presidential elections in France, 
and the potential for the AFD to gain more influence in the German federal government, the likelihood for a change in the relationship between Russia and the West is high. Still, it is unclear exactly what will happen as Western countries are internally divided as to whether or not a better relationship with Russia is a positive or negative prospect. For example, in the United States, while President Trump has talked about forming a deal with Russia to combat ISIS, while his advisors Steve Bannon and Secretary of State Tillerson and Secretary of Defense Mathis have less favorable views about Russia. It is also uncertain how much influence the AFD will achieve by gaining seats in the German parliament during the upcoming election. Thorsten Benner explains, I think in, in the general elections you can, you can say with some certainty that the AFD will kind of uh, enter parliament, but uh, it's not clear that they will get like 15 or 20 percent of the vote. They have a lot of work to do, groundwork in terms of establishing themselves. It is difficult to predict how much influence Russia will have in Europe without the results of the French and German elections. However, regardless of the outcome, it is likely that the relationship between Russia and the West will change as right-wing populist parties gain more support throughout Europe. This is Michael Ayanalfo for The Global Current. Joseph Origo looks into the recently declared famine in South Sudan. On Monday, February 20th, 2017, government officials from two counties in South Sudan declared a state of famine citing both the prolonged civil war in the area as well as economic crisis. Government officials in this following statement described the situation as dire. From February to July 2017, Lair and Mayendid are classified in famine, while Koch is classified as famine likely to happen. The long-term effects of the conflict, of the conflict coupled with high food prices economic crisis, <laughs> low agricultural production, <coughs> and depleted livelihood options are all contributing to the deterioration of the food security situation. Current statistics state that nearly 100,000 Sudanese civilians are on the brink of starvation and as many as 5 million civilians are in desperate need of aid and relief, CNN reports. Further, the crisis has placed as many as 1 million children at risk, this puts roughly 40% of the country's population in jeopardy. Shalice McDonough, a World Food Program spokesperson, explained the dire situation in this interview. People are already dying. Um, and so we have done everything possible to try to keep things from getting to this. But without that access to the, you know, some of the, the worst affected areas, um, there's, there's really only so much humanitarian relief can do without meaningful peace and security. Harvest have been Many UN officials said that this situation was not a sudden collapse, but instead a mass buildup of detrimental events that have plagued the country of South Sudan since it gained independence in 2011. Farming is disrupted due to civil war within the country, and nearly 1.5 billion citizens have fled to neighboring countries to escape the violence. These predominantly ethnically based conflicts, raging between the Sudanese president, Salva Kiir's army, comprised mostly of soldiers from the Dinka tribe, and his former deputy, Riek Makar's army, comprised mostly of the Nuer people, started nearly two years ago after Sudan declared its independence, and it has yet to be peacefully resolved. The conflict has converted much of the rich farmland into a constant battlefield and has produced more casualties than food for the population. Sudan's economic situation has also caused the food prices to inflate nearly 800%. Unfortunately, these concerning circumstances are not isolated to South Sudan. The UN has warned that three countries, Yemen, Somalia, and Nigeria, are at risk for famine as well, according to a report with The Guardian. This raises the question, where can relief be found? Further, how will the famine affect continually raging civil war in Sudanese citizens as a whole? 
Despite these dangerous conditions and intimidating statistics, UNICEF has already made a sound concrete plan to help an upward of over 200,000 children this year. Another UN assistance program, the World Food Program, announced that over 265,000 metric tons of food will be delivered to South Sudan, the largest amount since the nation's independence. The Food and Agricultural Organization also delivered roughly 2.3 million emergency livelihood kits to the citizens of South Sudan, as well as assistance in tasks such as fishing and farming. In addition, these organizations vaccinated over 6 million livestock animals to prevent the future loss of resources. Powerful Western states are also planning to contribute to the relief of the Sudanese famine. The European Commission reported that over 80 million euros will be made available to the state of Sudan in order to aid its efforts in relieving the area of this catastrophe. Beyond the European Union, the British Department for International Development announced that 100 million pounds will be allocated for South Sudanese aid and an additional 100 million pounds will be made available for Somalia as well, another country at risk for famine. However, despite these large donations from both the United Kingdom and the European Union, the United States of America still remains the top country providing relief funds for South Sudan, sending roughly 2.1 billion U.S. dollars since the year 2014. Aside from those funds being donated to the area by global superpowers, this crisis has caused outcry for many community leaders. European Union Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management, Christos Stellans, called for the government and opposition forces to cease the blockade of relief to the hardest hit areas by humanitarian aid groups. Pope Francis has also spoken out amidst the crisis, pleading with the world leaders to send help and not to leave the people of South Sudan to be condemned to death, according to another report by The Guardian. While this situation appears incredibly dire, through the funding of aid programs, continuous allocation of foreign relief, and global awareness, the famine crisis can be alleviated. However, it is crucial that government forces and their opposition units choose ethics over politics and allow these relief efforts to reach the citizens who need them. This is Joseph Verico reporting for The Global Current. Finally this morning, Daniel Kim brings us an interview with the School of Diplomacy's Dr. Nabila Alam about the role of technological advancement in nation development. Hello, this is Daniel Kim, reporting for Global Currents, and today we, today we're with uh, Professor Alam with our discussion about the the role that advancement in technology will play in in countries. That are either developing or developed. Thank you again for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you. That's great, buddy. Right. To start off, so the first question is, what are some of the biggest challenges that the developing countries in the that are currently trying to fulfill the UN sustainable goals by 2030? What kind of problems are they facing currently? First of all, it's, it's good to keep in mind that there are 17 different uh, sustainable development goals with 169 targets. So these don't apply uniformly to all the developing countries. Uh, the countries need to prioritize which goals uh, uh, they need to tackle first and foremost. So for example, the problems of the Africa are going to be very different those in South Asia or Latin America, and you need to be cognizant of that. Having said that, um, in terms of uh, poverty and um, underdevelopment, um, the, the areas that are uh, of most concern are Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So, and, and then there are different um, issues with each of these regions. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have um, problems of infrastructure roads, railways, electricity, um, there are high fertility rates, um, there are dangers uh, from climate change, um, which, um, which uh, manifest themselves in terms of um, the level of droughts that are ha happening, um, how arid regions are becoming more arid, and uh, these, um, these are some of the challenges. In South Asia, on the other hand, there are also food security issues, but it's uh, based more on the fact that there's such a large population over there. So 
we had the Green Revolution there in the 60s where, populate, uh, where crop yields went up. But um, there's, in, in a sense, um, a need for uh, another revolution of that sort to, to um, make South Asia um, uh, self-sufficient in terms of voters. Uh, there are also issues about social inclusion and particularly gender norms in other areas, not issues of inequality, and uh, that needs to be addressed. And of course, we need to keep in mind that within these regions, countries are going to vary a lot. So the problems that are going to face Nepal are not the same as the problems that are, going, that are facing Maldives. Regarding with these issues that uh, various countries are facing today, so there have been also been uh, development in, in the technological side in regards with the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and new new innovations that, will, that can actually um, help help many uh, businesses, uh, government ag agency, and academia in, um, in addressing these issues. But um, how do you think... Um, those uh, new innovation could level out the playing field for those developing nations? Well, well there are a couple of sides uh, to this issue. Um, uh, advances in technology and, and the way we're combining technology um, and controlling it is, is um, there's definitely a lot of um, um, optimism around how we can use this in, uh, in developing countries. So for example, using drones in agriculture for figuring out when, when um, you know, when is irrigation needed, how much is needed, advances in medicine, um, health technology, um, even having cell phones make it easier to reach rural um, um, populations and kind of help them in terms of, you know, trying to get um, health statistics or remind people that they have to take their medicine. So there's a good bet over there and having these technologies help developing as we're relying more and more on advanced technologies production and major production is also changing. I mean tech manufacturers higher tech manufacturing, which requires a set of uh, skills. Um, or this could also mean that for developing countries that rely on low-tech manufacturing, more skill-intensive labor to actually employ more people and um, um, give them a jump start on uh, economic growth and maintaining that, there's a danger that these kind of jobs are going to be lost as they come back to the U.S. but uh, for high-tech manufacturing. And these pro um, are not just the U.S. to advanced countries in general. And that's something we're, we're seeing in developed, advanced nations as well, where the higher skills that are needed uh, in manufacturing are causing um, job dislocations. All right, to follow up on that question, so like, how do you think different sectors and industries, such as the government, businesses, and academia, could help uh, regular people to prepare for that reality? Uh, that's, this is a very important question, and I, I think there is a role for all uh, facets of society to come in um, and tackle this. In terms of um, uh, academia, it's, uh, it's, it's to continue the role of actually giving students the skills that they need, whether it's in um, you know, high tech, whether it's in communications, and you know, adapting the skills on offer in classes to um, the skills that um, uh, our future workers will need. But it's also to recognize that um, the kind of uh, jobs that are available, uh, or that used to be available before where you could come out of high school and um, be able to go alone to the kind of manufacturing jobs that give, gave you a good, decent pay, that's not the case anymore. Now you have to go beyond high school education to get the kind of manufacturing jobs that you need because you'll be working with machinery, you're operating machinery tests, using robotics, and so on and so forth. So there's also a role for um, community colleges to step up over here. And to the extent that businesses can team up with um, both colleges and community colleges to um, um, to 
device curriculum where they say that you know these are the skills that we need, these are the kind of training we're going to offer, or there are technical colleges that can do that. And you're already seeing this in some of the um, some of the states uh, they're trying to do this. Right. In terms of the government, also there's a big role for the government in, in acknowledging that there's a transition that's happening. Um, what can the government do to ease this transition? from um, the kind of, um, you know, from high school to both college and um, community college technical um, skills upgrading. So in terms of um, providing access to education, that's really important in the U.S. Education is very expensive. So even trying to get the kind of skills you need for the jobs of today is going to be difficult. Um, there has to be some method of, um, you know, uh, taxing and redistribution to get these colleges funded or to help people transition. Um, there's the earned income tax credit. Um, there's talk of wage loss insurance um, that are more applicable to uh, workers who, um, who are maybe 45 or, uh, or above who may not be able to uh, skills up, uh, upgrade their skills as needed. So there are a number of uh, host of different solutions that can come from business, from academia, and from government that uh, need to act in uh, concert to, to address this issue. All right, uh, one final question, and and on a more personal note, how, how do you, how would you think that college students right now who are in liberal arts colleges, and how do you think um, they could better prepare themselves for for uh, for this uh, upcoming new uh, social dimension that'll be coming up soon? Especially for those, uh, especially for those uh, who who are not STEM majors in any regards. Right, that's a great question. I think that the important um, thing to recognize is that uh, if you're going into STEM, you're probably going to be involved with a lot of creating the new technologies. But these technologies are used in certain applications. And that's used by um, people across the world who STEM things not. So as liberal arts majors, um, you're, you're honing your, um, you know, critical thinking skills, your analytical skills. Um, you're, you'd be using these both in interpreting um, um, data, you'll be using this in reading data. So to the extent that you can um, understand the critical aspect of, you know, whatever job area that you're going into, into whatever decision making that's needed, and you can supplement that with um, some technological know-how or in um, data interpretation, visualization, those kind of skills are really very important. How do you combine your knowledge with the help that you can get from these technological advances? So it's going to be the, um, the complementary side of things that are going to be All right. Uh, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, thank you, Professor, for <laughs> taking the time out of your uh, schedule. And this is Daniel Kieran reporting out for Global Currents. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of The Global Current. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm Morgan Mount. And I'm Jack LaForge. Same time. Same place. Next, next week. week. The Global Current is brought to you by the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. Our executive producer is Liam Scollins. Our associate producer is Morgan Mount. Our news editor is John Trudeau. Our analysis editor is Marissa Hutton. Our technical producer is Trevor West. And our interview segment was produced by Daniel Kim. Special thank you to Dr. Nabila Alam. The Global Current theme song is Acid Jazz by Kevin McLeod. You've been listening to The Global Current on WSOU 89.5 FM, Seton Hall's Pirate Radio.